We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm -hmm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the darkened hour. Welcome to the darkened hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. In this episode, I will be explaining the CIA and the United States war on Osama bin Laden. We will start with bin Laden being expelled from Saudi Arabia and living inside the Sudan. However, things don't go as planned. And after spending tens of millions of his own money to rebuild infrastructure, build training camps and businesses, bin Laden is pressured by the United States under Bill Clinton to be forcibly expelled out of the Sudan. In March of 1996, the US pressures the Sudan to do something about bin Laden, who is currently based in that country. According to some accounts, the Sudan, led by its president Omar al-Bashir, readily agrees, not wanting to be labeled a terrorist nation. Sudan's defense minister engages in secret negotiations with the CIA in Washington. Sudanese officials offer to extradite bin Laden to anywhere he might stand trial. Some accounts claim that Sudan offers bin Laden to the United States but that the United States decide not to take him because they do not have enough evidence at this time to charge him with a crime. Richard Clark, the counterterrorism star for both Clinton and Bush administrations, calls this story a false invented by the Sudanese and Americans friendly to the Sudan. He points out that the bin Laden was an ideological blood brother, family friend, and benefactor to Sudanese leader Hassan al-Turabi, leader of the Islamic National Front. So any offers to hand him over may have been disingenuous. The CIA director George Tenet later denied that Sudan made any direct offers to hand over bin Laden. The US reportedly asks Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Jordan to accept bin Laden into custody but is refused by all three governments. Much later, the 9-11 Commission would later claim that it had found no evidence that the Sudanese officials or government offered bin Laden directly to the United States. But it does find evidence that Saudi Arabia is discussed as an option. US officials insist that bin Laden leave the country for anywhere but Somalia. One U.S. intelligence source in the region would later state, we kidnapped minor drug stars and bring them back in burlap bags. Somebody didn't want this to happen. But as the 9-11 Commission would later note that the Sudanese regime began to change from being a radical militant country to wanting to work with the United States to lessen economic sanctions, Though al Tarabi had been its inspirational leader, its president, Omar al-Bashir, had never been entirely under his thumb, as many would lead to believe. Thus, as outside pressures mounted, al-Bashir's supporters began to displace those of Hassan al-Tarabi. 
1995, the United States began putting some serious pressure on Sudan to deal with bin Laden. And on March 8th, 1996, the United States sent Sudan a memorandum listing the measures Sudan could take to get the sanctions revoked. The second of six points listed is provide us with names, dates of arrival, departure and destination, and passport data on Mujahideen that Osama bin Laden had brought into the Sudan. Sudanese intelligence had been monitoring bin Laden since he'd moved there in 1991, collecting a vast intelligence database on Osama bin Laden and more than 200 leading members of his Al-Qaeda network. The files include information on their backgrounds, families and contacts, plus photographs, an entire database collection. There was also extensive information on bin Laden's worldwide financial network. One US source who has seen the files on bin Laden's men in Khartoum said some were an inch and a half thick. An Egyptian intelligence officer with extensive Sudanese intelligence contacts said they knew all about them, who they were, where they came from. They had copies of their passports, their tickets. They knew where they went. Of course, that information could have helped enormously. It is the history of those people. To the surprise of U.S. officials making the demands, the Sudanese seem receptive to sharing the file. This leads to a battle within the U.S. government between top FBI officials who want to engage the Sudanese and get their files, and Clinton's Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and Susan Rice, her Assistant Secretary for Africa, who want to isolate them politically and economically. The National Security Council was also opposed. The U.S. decides to increase its demands and tells Sudan to turn over not just the files on bin Laden, but bin Laden himself. Ultimately, the U.S. will get Sudan to evict bin Laden in May of 1996, but they will not press for the files and will not get them. An American involved in the secret negotiations later would say, I've never seen a brick wall like that before. Somebody let this slip up. We could have dismantled his operations and put a cage on top. It was not a matter of arresting bin Laden, but of access to information. That's the story. And that's what could have prevented September 11th. I knew it would come back to haunt us. Vanity Fair magazine later will opine, how could this have to happen? The simple answer is that the Clinton administration had ex accused Sudan of sponsoring terrorism and refused to believe that anything it did to prove its bona fides could be genuine. The US will continue to refuse Sudan's offers to take the files. By 1997 and early 1998, bin Laden had then been deported to Afghanistan, where he was welcomed by the Taliban. However, bin Laden was put under house arrest after his first fatwa against the United States. The Taliban didn't want the United States to become suddenly concerned with Afghanistan, for they were fighting against the Northern Alliance for control of the country. They didn't want another 10 year war with a superpower. By early 1997, the United States had developed a plan to capture bin Laden in Afghanistan. A CIA owned aircraft was stationed in a nearby country, ready to land on a remote landing strip long enough to pick him up. However, Problems with having to hold bin Laden too long in Afghanistan made the operation unlikely. The plan morphs into using a team of Afghan informants to kidnap bin Laden 
from inside his heavily defended farm. In this month, the plan is given to CIA Director Tenet for approval, but he rejects it without showing it to President Clinton. It is thought unlikely to succeed and the Afghan allies are considered unreliable. Bin Laden would continue to rail against the United States, making declarations of war, holding small conferences with news agencies, basically anything to get the attention of the media to know that Al Qaeda was serious about ramping up operations against the United States. إلى أن يقتدوا بمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما جاء عنه من علم ويتبعوا ما علموا منه من عمل وأن ينفروا إلى أرض الإعداد. August 7, 1998. Two U.S. embassies in Africa are bombed almost simultaneously. The attack in Nairobi, Kenya kills 213 people, including 12 U.S. nationals, and injures more than 4,500 in the attack. The attack in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania kills 11 and injures 85. The attack is blamed at Al-Qaeda. And it showed for the first time that Al-Qaeda had the capability for simultaneous attacks. A third attack on the U.S. Embassy in Uganda fails. In mid-August of 1998, President Clinton signed a memorandum of notification which authorizes the CIA to plan the capture of bin Laden using force. The CIA drawed up detailed profiles of bin Laden's daily routines, where he sleeps, and his travel arrangements. The assassination, however, never happens, supposedly because of inadequate intelligence. However, as one officer later says, you can keep setting the bar higher and higher so that nothing ever gets done. An officer who helped draw up the plan said, we were ready to move, but we were not allowed to do it because of the stubborn policy of risk avoidance. It is a disgrace. Additional memoranda quickly follows that authorize the assassination of up to 10 other Al-Qaeda leaders and authorize to shoot down a private aircraft containing bin Laden. National Security Advisor Sandy Berger and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright repeatedly seek consideration of a boots on the ground option to kill bin Laden using the elite Delta Force. Clinton also supports the idea, telling Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Henry Shelton, you know, it could scare the crap out of Al Qaeda if suddenly a bunch of black ninjas repelled out of helicopters into the middle of their camp. However, Shelton says he wants nothing to do with such an idea. He calls it naive and ridicules it as going Hollywood. He says he would need a large force, not a small team. Central Command Chief General Anthony Zinni is considered the chief opponent to the boots on the ground idea. Clinton orders formal planning for a mission to capture the Al-Qaeda leadership. Reports are contradictory, but some claim Clinton was told such plans were drawn up when in fact they were not. In any event, no such plans were ever implemented. President Clinton signs additional, more explicit directives authorizing the CIA to plan the assassination of bin Laden in early 1999. The initial emphasis is on capturing bin Laden and only killing him if the capture attempt is unsuccessful. The military is unhappy about this. So Clinton continues to sign additional directives before leaving office, 
each one authorizing the use of lethal force more clearly than the one before. Intelligence reports by February of 1999 foresee the presence of bin Laden at a desert hunting camp in Afghanistan for about a week. Information on his presence appears reliable, so preparations are made to target his location with cruise missiles. However, intelligence also puts an official aircraft of the United Arab Emirates and members of the royal family from that country in the same location. Bin Laden is hurting, is hunting with the Emirati royals as he did with leaders from the UAE and Saudi Arabia on other occasions. Policymakers are concerned that a strike might kill a prince or other senior officials, so the strike never happens. A top United Arab Emirati official at the time denies that high level officials are there, but evidence subsequently confirms their presence nevertheless. U.S. intelligence obtains detailed reporting of where bin Laden was located for five consecutive nights. CIA Director Tenet decides against acting three times because of concerns about collateral damage and worries about the veracity of the single source of information. Alex Station Top Chief Michael Scheuer would end up getting into arguments with senior top-level officials at the national principal meetings. One CIA official writes to a colleague in the field, having a chance to get bin Laden three times in 36 hours and foregoing the chance each time has made it a bit angry. There was one more opportunity to strike bin Laden in July of 99, but after that, there was apparently no intelligence good enough to justify considering a strike. In November of 1999, Kabir Mohabat, an Afghan American businessman, had initiated conversations about bin Laden between the US government and the Taliban. According to Mohabat, the Taliban were ready to hand over bin Laden over to a third country or the International Court of Justice in exchange for having the US-led sanctions against American Afghan lifted. Elmar Brock, a German member of the European Parliament, later confirmed that he helps Mohabat make contact with the US government in that month. The initial talks lead to a secret meeting that month between Taliban ministers and US officials in a Frankfurt hotel. Taliban Foreign Minister Wakil Ahmad Mutakwali reportedly says in the meeting, you can have him whenever the Americans are ready. Name us a country and we will extradite him. However, after this face-to-face -face meeting, further discussions are never held because Brock believes a political decision has been made by US officials not to continue the negotiations. He does not clarify when he believes such a decision was made. September 11th, 2001. American Airlines 11 crashes into the North Tower. United Airlines Flight 175 crashes into the South. News reporters come down to ground zero where the attacks had just taken place. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now waiting to play on all of them. Hours after United Airlines Flight 93 had crashed into a field in Pennsylvania, the CIA's counterterrorism center had many of its employees returning to work. Some had worked 24 hours straight to read the information from around the world, which was coming in at a steady pace, sometimes unrelenting. The suspect who was blamed for the terrorist attacks in New York City 
in Washington, D.C., was none other than Osama bin Laden. All throughout the summer of 2001, intelligence was pouring in from many countries, warning the United States that bin Laden and al-Qaeda were planning something big. The flight manifests for the planes which were hijacked were sent to the CTC Operations Center, where it ultimately was handed to George Tenet. To his shock, he muttered, oh my God, it's all of them. Two names struck him, Khalid al-Midar and Awaf al-Hazmi, the same suspects the CIA had monitored since they left the house in Sana, Yemen, where they traveled to a high-level al-Qaeda meeting in Malaysia. Not to mention the suspects from the Hamburg cell who were living in Germany while being monitored by the German BFB and the CIA, who then relocated to Florida, New Jersey, Virginia, and New York City, who many of them were made known from the foreign intelligence services of Israel and Saudi Arabia, who were operating without the knowledge of the United States government inside the United States. Just a few months prior to the attacks, the Israeli government had given the CIA a list of suspects who they felt might be participating in a terrorist attack in the near future. Many of them were already inside the United States. Again, the Israelis didn't mention this fact, nor that they were monitoring them in the first place. Tenet immediately notified the State Department of a military reaction to the terrorist attacks in the country. There needed to be a vicious response, but this time with the gloves off, as Kofor Black, the deputy chief of the CTC, once remarked to the Joint House Inquiry Panel in 2003. However, the reaction had to come from the CIA Special Activities Division and US Special Operations Command. The plan to find and kill all Al Qaeda fighters and those who harbor them, as well as its emir, Osama bin Laden. The plan was birthed back in 1999, in the months after the US Embassy bombings of Kenya and Tanzania. Tenet had declared war on Al Qaeda in December of 1998, just three months after the bombings had taken place. Tenet gave Kofor Black the authority and had him outline a plan of attack against Al Qaeda. By July 1999, Black drafted the plan, an outline to locate and destroy Al Qaeda and bin Laden. It was codenamed Jawbreaker. It had been briefed to CIA operational level personnel, as well as to the NSA, the FBI, the DIA, and other partners. According to a source close to the Central Intelligence Agency's Counterterrorism Center, the baseline draft went like this. Kofor Black and his new bin Laden unit wanted to project into Afghanistan to penetrate bin Laden sanctuaries. They described their plan as military officers might. They sought to surround Afghanistan with secure covert bases for CIA operations, as many bases as they could arrange. Then they would mount operations from each of the platforms trying to move inside Afghanistan and as close to bin Laden as they could to recruit agents and to attempt capture operations. Black wanted recruitments and he wanted to develop commando or paramilitary strike teams made up of officers and men who could blend into the region's Muslim populations. The CIA and the Counterterrorism Center began calling up a very select group of individuals who would later become part of the largest CIA operation in its history. Tenet would end up tasking Hank Crumpton to work with the CTC. Crumpton, a long serving case officer who at age 23 had been the youngest trainee in his class, became involved in the investigation of the Al Qaeda bombings of the US Embassy in Kenya and Tanzania and the 2000 attack on the USS Cole off the coast of Yemen. Crumpton was a novel but unquestioned choice, a dedicated company man with a no-nonsense dedication rarely seen at his age. By February of 2000, 
Black had tasked Gary Bernstein, a career officer who served in the director of operations between 1982 to create a team which would serve as a springboard for establishing a presence in Afghanistan. The code name for the deployments was Jawbreaker. The mission in which Bernstein was given was simple, to enter the Panjshir Valley and begin working with Ahmed Shah Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance, who are fighting against the Taliban and gather intelligence on bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda training camp. Gary Schroen, a 30-year veteran with the CIA's Near East Division, Directorate of Operations in 1999, a post he held through 2001, was semi-retired at this time, but worked at the CIA's Islamabad as he was chief of station. He was familiar with the culture and tribes in Afghanistan and had begun working with the Northern Alliance to find as much information about bin Laden as possible, but he remained elusive. After the September 11th attacks, it was the Taliban who gave the first media interview declaring that they were not involved with the attacks, that they had no knowledge of the attacks, and that bin Laden, while he was inside the country, was not made aware that he was behind the attacks. There's also, uh, also been concerns expressed about Arab mercenary fighters in Afghanistan and Arab allegations, uh, allegations that there may be an Arab connection to these acts of terrorism have also been raised. Can you talk to those concerns? Can you rule out any Arab link? Uh, Arabi Akba, Yabaz Gassi, Gulukuna, Chile, one of the Nia Hatar and Sansari. Tapsi, you walk last to Logan to the Pifu Kiham Radoui? The Fikr Punchi, that fish of their low fish of them. That was a few chapters in Mosul, which is Rata Monaju, which is that Karuki. That was a case she, you know, in Safi, you're some to me running. Uh, it is a very big and uh, enormous uh, incident, so just to connect it uh, with uh, some people that even uh, one's logic cannot even accept it, so in my opinion it, will, it might not be a justifying. Mr. Madhukil, are you surprised that the United States has received this sort of attack? The American media has to be this year, and the American media has to be this year. The big word that she put the whole no idea of the case of the capital is in the low fishy. That's a part of the big word. Uh, naturally, because this might be uh, the only and the unique kind of incident in the history of the United States. So. After Tenet had read the flight manifest on that September 11th evening, he would begin designing a new covert unit, which would begin a new plan. The unit, CTC operations, in which Hank Crumpton, Tenet's prize, was to lead. Gary Schroen was having difficulty working with the native Afghans as they were a tribal people, always working with and against one another for the right price. Bernstein, however, would be chosen to replace Schroen and lead the jawbreaker unit, as this was Crumpton's call. As soon as Bernstein landed at Islamabad airport, he was taken to see Schroen, who informed him that he was the new chief of Jawbreaker. Schroen filled him in. The teams would work alongside the Afghans to produce intelligence on enemy positions and capabilities that CTC headquarters would use to drive and coordinate the war, while working alongside the U.S. Central Command General Tommy Franks. On October 19, 2001, 200 U.S. Army Rangers from the 75th Regiment would end up capturing a key area an airstrip just 75 miles north of Kandahar. Crumpton would begin the Bernstein-led operations by having the Deputy Director for Intelligence, John McLaughlin, in charge of operations along with Tommy Franks. Vice Admiral Albert Calland with Special Operations Command of SOCOM, Bernstein would begin supplying the Chajiks and began the fight against the Taliban in the Panjshir Valley. There would be a number of different teams operating with jawbreaker teams. The Hizb e Wahadat Hazaka, led by Karim Khalil. The Uzbeks, 
led by Rashid Dotsam, and the Northern Alliance, now led by General Mohammed Qasim Fahim Massoud, was assassinated two days prior to the September 11th attacks by two Al Qaeda men posing as cameramen waiting to interview him. Fighting in the eastern front of the country were U.S. Special Force units led by Lieutenant Colonel Chris Haas, the commander of Special Forces Team 555. Haas was in command of all Special Forces units in eastern Afghanistan. Washington wanted a pincer attack on the Taliban hiding out in caves and ditches whose numbers were in the tens of thousands. With the Northern Alliance from the south, and the Eastern Alliance and Haas to the east, starting with the doorbreaker team to destroy Taliban targets in the Somali Plains, located just north of Kabul, the country's capital. Where the Northern Alliance and doorbreaker teams had defeated the Taliban, the Alliance would stop five miles outside of Kabul and allow the United Nations to come and organize a peaceful transition of power, which would be handed over to Hamid Karzai. Karzai, had previously served as Deputy Foreign Minister in the Islamic State of Afghanistan, while also being the head of the Popalazi tribe of Pashtun people. He also visited the Western embassies, including the US Embassy in Islamabad several times, talking with Norbert Hull, and attempted to gain American support from modern educated Afghans to weaken the Taliban's views. In July of 99, the Taliban had assassinated Karzai's father, Abdul Ahad Karzai, the son, led the charge ever since against the Taliban. One of the jawbreaker units were led by RJ and the special forces team he was under, 595, which would also radio in airstrikes and Taliban locations in Mazar e Sharif, while General Datsum would charge against dazed Taliban fighters immediately afterwards. Tens of thousands of Taliban fighters were no match for the US B-52s and their incessant airstrikes, which leveled their positions while Dotson's armies raised what was left on the ground, which was usually led by vicious general who usually wielded a sword by force. By November 10th, the Tajiks took control of the city and freed native Uzbeks from Taliban captivity. With their recent defeat, the Taliban fighters then heated east toward Kunduz, as RJ and the Special Force Team 595 went north to meet them and engage them in battle. With Mazar-e-Sharif now under the control of General Datsum, the Friendship Bridge, which was open between Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, was now used by the US and Afghans to facilitate logistical support. Central Command could now focus its air power on the town of Talukwin, which is the capital of the Takar province in northeastern Afghanistan. Another one of Jawbreaker's teams was led by Breen, was already in Taliban. Breen was under the Special Forces Team 585, which was headed under by Master Sergeant John Boydulk. Boydulk was relentless as he called in US airstrikes from the powerful Spectre C-130 gunships, which made the Taliban quickly relinquish the city. The Spectre C-130s are heavily armed, long endurance aircraft, carrying an array of anti-ground oriented weapons that are integrated with sophisticated sensors, navigation and fire control systems. Meanwhile, over at the Somali Plains, Lieutenant Colonel Haas was waiting for orders to begin making advancements. Bernstein, however, was patient. Jawbreaker reports had collected information that Osama bin Laden was seen fleeing the Nagahar province and heading toward Jalalabad. Hank Crumpton gave the order to Bernstein to begin forward advancements. The Taliban had hunkered down for a final showdown in mazar e sharif as approximately 5,000 fighters were trying to defend against Dotson forces with Mohammed Daoud in the west and Beria Kalan Khan in the east as US airstrikes rained down from above. Knowing that they could not win nor stand with the daily assaults, the Taliban surrendered. The final stage was now to capture or kill bin Laden and the rest of his Al Qaeda fighters that were with him, numbering somewhere between 200 
and 250. The idea was to trap bin Laden and his fighters in a kill box between three promontories manned by US Special Force teams. Two new teams would be positioned to the south and west, one on Tonga Mountain and another closer to Sangala Hill further south, while the original post near Milgawa would be reestablished to the east. U.S. Central Command under Bernstein orders bombarded the White Mountains as B-52 and B-1 bombers from carrier ships stationed in the Persian Gulf saturated the mountainside with heavy artillery fire in the day while using Spectre AC-130 ships at night. Al-Qaeda hid in the caves to avoid being reduced to molecules. Using such heavy aerial bombardment, Bernstein wanted to flush bin Laden against the White Mountains like a wall. It all seemed almost an impossible task to escape for bin Laden. However, it was one last chance to escape and Bernstein also knew it. Behind bin Laden was an escape route that went from the White Mountains into a heavily wooden forest into Pakistan, a road which led straight into Jalalabad. What he wanted was to have the permission to call up just 250 US Special Force fighters to block off the last escape route. Bernstein called General Tommy Franks, who would end up taking orders from the US State Department under Bush. Franks reported back to Bernstein and relayed a message. Let the Afghans block off the back end to Pakistan. Bernstein was livid, for he knew they could not be fully trusted for this mission. The area assaults from the Blue 82, known as Dady Cutter bombs, completely destroyed and flattened the ground, scorched earth, flattened trees, which meant Al Qaeda could be seen from above in the open, making them easy prey for the Spectre C 130 and B 52s making them an absolute target for death. Bernstein immediately called Crumpton. Maybe he could help get the men needed to block the escape route. However, it was forwarded back to General Franks. Then a sudden change in plans, something which blindsided Bernstein. Crumpton had called the next day and said that he was to be replaced with the former chief of the Bin Laden issue station, Richard Blee. He is to be arriving soon with a liaison officer, which is later known to be Michelle and Casey. Meanwhile, here was a huge defeat for Al Qaeda under the unrelenting aerial bombing campaigns near Gardaz, approximately 260 miles north of Kandahar in the evening hours of November 14th, Mohammed Atef, Al Qaeda's top military commander, had been asleep in a guest house along with several of the members. Saeed Al Adal Masri, Al Qaeda's organizational chief of military operations, spoke about what happened next. We heard a missile passing over our heads immediately before we had finished eating, and it exploded 100 meters from the house. We immediately started to leave, fearing that we were the target and the targeting would be corrected so as to hit us. We left the house and saw the smoke at the end of the street as the US aircraft flew overhead. There were two houses where the missile fell. One belonged to the Arab Afghan families, but was empty and the other belonged to Taliban. I thought they targeted the students, the Taliban members. We looked at the aircraft and saw it fire a second missile and we took cover. It fell in the middle of the road the brothers and I walked on foot to a nearby position. A student's patrol we met on the way told me that there were Arab women in the house and that a brother was killed and another injured and both were evacuated to a hospital while all the women left and went to the villages. American intelligence intercepted communications from those digging through the rubble of Atom's home, leading them to believe that they were successful in killing him. During a search of the rubble, US military and special forces would find important documents such as Al Qaeda training manuals and manuals on guerrilla warfare. It was a tremendous kill for the Americans. 
With the cold month of December raging and the snow tops of the White Mountains capped, Bin Laden and approximately now 400 Al Qaeda fighters were hiding in local houses and in the caves. A radio, which was recovered in a former Taliban safe house, which was used to listen in on the radio transmissions of Al Qaeda fighters, had heard the voice of its top man, Osama bin Laden, apologizing to his men, fearing that they would be killed soon, and forgetting them trapped against the White Mountains of Tora Bora. Bin Laden was heard, I'm sorry for getting you involved in the battle. If you can no longer resist, you may surrender with my blessing. Bin Laden was allowed more time to escape. According to a report entitled, Tora Bora Revisited, How We Failed to Get Bin Laden and Why It Matters Today, which was presented to the Committee on Foreign Relations on November 30th, 2009, the Special Operations Command history records that CENTCOM refused to back the ceasefire, suspecting a ruse, but it's said the Special Op forces agreed reluctantly to an overnight pause in the bombing to avoid killing the surrendering Al-Qaeda fighters. Gan Shari, negotiated by radio with representatives of Al-Qaeda, initially told Dalton Fury, a member of the US Special Forces against bin Laden, that a large number of Algerians wanted to surrender. Then he said that he could turn over the entire Al-Qaeda leadership. Fury's suspicions increased at such a bold promise. By the morning of December 12, no Al-Qaeda fighters had appeared, and the Delta Force commander concluded that the whole episode was a hoax. Intelligence estimates are that as many as 800 Al-Qaeda fighters escaped that night, but bin Laden stuck it out. During the unreliability of his Afghan allies, Fury refused to give up. He plotted ways to use his 40 Delta Force soldiers and the handful of other special op troops under his command to go after bin Laden on their own. One of the plans was to go at bin Laden from one direction he would never anticipate, the Southern side of the mountains. We want to come in on the back door, Fury explained later pointing on a map to the side of the Dorbor enclave facing Pakistan. The peaks there rose to 14,000 feet. And the valleys and precipitous mountains passes were already deep in snow. The audacious assault was nixed somewhere up to the chain of command. Undeterred, Fury suggested dropping hundreds of landmines along the passes leading to Pakistan to block bin Laden's escape. First guy blows his leg off, everybody else stops, he said. That allows aircraft overhead to find them. They see all these heat sources out there, okay? This is a big, large group of Al-Qaeda moving south. They can engage that. That proposal was rejected too. About the same time, Fury was desperately concocting scenarios for going after bin Laden and getting rejections from up the chain of command, Franks was well into planning for the next war, the invasion of Iraq. Radio intercepts and other intelligence, the CIA pinpointed bin Laden in the mountains near the border of Pakistan. Following the strategy of keeping an Afghan face on the war, Fury's Delta team joined the CIA and Afghan fighters and piled into pickup trucks. They videotaped their journey to a place called Tora Bora. Fury told us his orders were to kill bin Laden and leave the body with the Afghans. Right here, you're looking at basically the battlefield from the last location that we had firm on uh, Osama bin Laden's location. This ridge line is at about 14,000 feet, and back this way toward me is Pakistan. That's right. On a scale of, say, 1 to 10, 10 being the toughest, how tough a position is this to attack? In my experience, it's a 10. Delta developed an audacious plan to come at bin Laden from the one direction he would never expect. We want to come in on the back door. You were going to come up over the tops of the peaks? That's right. The original plan uh, that we sent up to our higher headquarters, Delta Force wants to come in over the mountain with oxygen, coming from the Pakistan side, over the mountains and come in and get a drop on bin Laden from behind. Why didn't you do that? 
uh, disapproved at some level above us, whether that was uh, Central Command uh, or all the way up to the President of the United States, I'm, I'm not sure. The next option Delta wanted to employ was to drop hundreds of landmines in the mountain passes that led to Pakistan, bin Laden's escape route. First guy blows his leg off, everybody else stops. That allows aircraft overhead to find them. They see all these heat sources out there. Okay, there's a big, large group of Al-Qaeda moving south. They can engage that. Why didn't you do that? Disapproved. Why was it not approved? I have no idea. Bin Laden is said to have split his group in two. 135 of his men headed east into Pakistan. Over 200 others, including bin Laden, left for the Pashtun tribal area of Panjshiriar, guided by members of the Gizli tribe, a local Pashtun people. When Bernstein returned to the United States, he knew when they pulled him off jawbreaker, they had in essence pulled the final plug on the operation. Bernstein also viewed his replacement, Blee, as being there, along with Michelle Ann Casey, head of the Ahmed al Hada al-Qaeda communications hub in Yemen, as not having to testify before the 9-11 National Commission or the Joint House Inquiry. The most important failure of CENTCOM leadership came at Tora Bora when they turned down the simple request by Bernstein for a battalion of only 250 U.S. Rangers to block Bin Laden's escape into Pakistan. However, General Tommy Franks, who denied the request by Bernstein, would lend his final thoughts in an op-ed piece posted by the New York Times in October of 2004. We don't know to this day whether Mr. Bin Laden was at Tora Bora in December of 2001. Some intelligence sources said he was. Others indicated he was in Pakistan at the time. Tora Bora was teeming with Taliban and Al-Qaeda operatives, but Bin Laden was never within our grasp. Dalton Fury would later respond Rather than allowing bin Laden to escape, Franks and Rumsfeld could have deployed American troops already in Afghanistan on or near the border with Pakistan to block the exits while simultaneously sending special operation forces and their Afghan allies up the Morton mountains to Tora Bora. The complex mission would have been risky, but analysis shows that it was well within the reach and capability of the American military. It seemed the war in Iraq took precedence over capturing the man who many in the State Department believed was behind the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. The war on terrorism could have ended right then and there. <laughs>